uh, if it is disseminated zoster, so you see rash in multiple areas uh, and you're concerned or they have pulmonary symptoms, then you would admit these patients and give them IV acyclovir. Remember too that zoster is usually quite painful for patients, so you want to address their pain. Um, these are usually older individuals who, uh, with anything in older individuals, be careful with opioid medications. Uh, and then it's a neuropathic pain. So some things that I'll use is like a topical lidocaine, but not, not directly on the rash, around the rash, like just to the side of it. Uh, they have the lidoderm patches can be ben helpful or a lighted, lidocaine cream, just not directly on the rash. Oh. I don't know what happened there. Sorry, guys. Um, and then, or gabapentin is the, a good drug for these. Uh, and then, and just any other medication that you like to use for neuropathic pain. So next would be herpes simplex, so HSV. So approximately 90%, if not more, of the world's population is seropositive for HSV-1 or HSV-2. HSV-1, so herpes simplex 1, is more typically associated with oral lesions, as the one up above. And then HSV-2 is genital herpes. Much HSV-1 is much more common, but uh, obviously a lot of the population will have one or both. Um, viral, the virus is in saliva, semen, cervical fluid. It occurs during the primary infection, most like it's most uh, contagious during the primary infection, but you can spread it during recurrence. Um, and why part of probably why people have it so much is because you can still spread it even if you don't have a rash. It's less common, um, but but you can because the spreading will be early on. With acute genital herpes, it's contracted through sexual intercourse. Uh, their vesicles are can be extremely painful. You can have severe lymphadenopathy and systemic illness with the primary infection. And that, that's something to keep in mind uh, because these are patients that could come to the ER because they don't feel well. They have a, like an a, acute viral illness. So it's flu-like symptoms, but they do have the onset of a rash. With the primary, you would treat with valcyclovir and acyclovir. You can also treat secondary outbreaks or you know tertiary outbreaks with these medications. Um, and then some people, if they're getting frequent outbreaks, will start an antiviral medication. Some pregnant women will um, do antiviral medication toward the end of their pregnancy if they're prone to getting outbreaks because this is something that can be passed from mo mother to fetus during uh, vaginal births. So that's another time that you would consider suppression or prophylactic antiviral medications. Uh, herpes simplex will have multiple complications, and this is one we've talked about with like our during our CNS and, and other kind of topics this month. But uh, as a reminder, so herpes meningitis uh, will typically have a pretty benign course. They present with mild meningitis symptoms, fever, headache, photophobia, meningismus with as with other viral meningitis, the on course tends to be a little longer than acute bacterial. So over days, uh, as opposed to, you know, over like 24 hours or hours, the CSF analysis will typically show a pleocytosis with a lymphocytic predominance, and then a mild elevation in protein. And then you'll have a positive PCR for herpes one and or two. Uh, treating you would treat this with IV acyclovir and it can um, reduce duration and prevent neurological sequela, especially in immunocompromised patients. Herpes encephalitis will typically present with a fever, altered mental status. Um, you can get behavioral changes if it's affecting the frontal lobe and then focal seizures. And with this, you would get really nonspecific CSF findings, but in imaging, so either CT with contrast or MRI, you would see temporal lobe, in lobe inflammation as this tends to go to the temporal lobes. Uh, you can check the HSV in the CSF and then the imaging would be 
uh, pretty consistent, which would help you with diagnosis. These patients are treated with a IV acyclovir. You can also get herpes simplex uh, keratitis. So that's red eye, like eye involvement of herpes simplex, uh, red eye, corneal numbness, and then dendritic lesions. So if you see a patient, if they have a zoster, uh, sorry, if they have a herpes and you're suspicious, make sure that you stay in their eye, um, look at how much it's involved. And this is something that you would consult ophthalmology if you're concerned for herpes simplex. So next is hepatitis. And, you know, as with some of the other things you guys probably see, especially some of these a, a little more than us, but hepatitis, very common. Um, we see it all the time. More often than not, we're seeing hepatitis A, hepatitis C, uh, those are tested easily. They're very prevalent within the, the population. Hepatitis E is probably under-recognized because not everybody will present to the emergency department with it. Um, there are actually five common hepatitis. There's actually some other, some people think there's other ones that are similar, but the main are the five. Uh, I put this chart in here. So like just as a, a nice way to summarize, but hepatitis A, like big things, fecal oral, con you get it from contaminated food, poorly washed uh, produce is the common place that people will get it. Doesn't typically produce a chronic infection. Um, you can get a vaccine for it and they'll recommend it for travel in certain places. And then usually treatment is is management of symptoms. B, blood to blood. So this is a sexually transmitted disease or through IV drug use, uh, anything where you're getting blood to blood. This can cause chronic infections. There is a vaccine for it, um, highly recommended in healthcare in people. So I think most of us are vaccinated for it and then um, treat the chronic infection. Hepatitis C, blood to blood, you can get it sexually transmitted, does cause a chronic, um, and then treatment. There are actually good treatments and even cures now for it. D is kind of unique because it basically has to be associated with hepatitis B, uh, typically blood to blood or sex. You can get a vaccine for it. Really getting vaccinated against hepatitis B really prevents you from getting hepatitis D because they have to work together. Um, E is another one that's fecal oral and you get it from contaminated food or, or water. And so just preparing everything, food safety measures will prevent this and then symptom, symptom control like E. So to touch on each kind of a little more, the hepatitis A is tran transmitted fecal to oral. Uh, you would get it through ingestion of contaminated food. You can get it through personal contact, uh, raw seafood, drinking contaminated water, or as I said, like if somebody is not washing produce correctly or using contaminated water to wash produce, uh, it will more often than not, it's occurring in third world countries, but can happen anywhere. Uh, there'll be outbreaks at restaurants in the United States fre quite frequently, really. Causes an acute form of hepatitis and there's no chronic stage. So the treatment is really just supportive. Uh, these patients are typically going to come in with nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, myalgias, uh, so treat appropriately, and then make sure they're avoiding any hepatotoxic drugs or alcohol so as not to um, harm the liver. There is a vaccine, so it's recommended uh, for most people when they travel to different countries. And then just making sure that you're eating safe, as safe as you can. And then most patients will recover within two months of this. Uh, some people will get relapsing symptoms or the virus can be reactivated and they'll get a recurrence or a prolongation of the disease. Um, hepatitis B, it, you can get both acute and chronic hepatitis from this. So the contact with blood transfusions. So transfusions were uh, they used to be much more common uh, way that people contracted hepatitis. It's usually pretty checked, but not completely unheard of at this point. Uh, you can get it through unsanitary tattoos, sexual intercourse. This is transmitted through breastfeeding. 
um, sharing syringes and IV drug use, uh, shaving accessories, razor blades, touching wounds or infected people, a needle stick and healthcare setting. So patients with chronic hepatitis B have antibodies against the virus, but not enough to clear the infected liver cells. So the continued production of virus and antibodies is likely a cause of immune complex disease. So that's kind of how you would get it. If you've had it once before, you might not have enough antibodies so that you do reactivate the disease and that's how you would end up getting a recurrence of it. Uh, there is a vaccine and it will prevent it for life. And hepatitis B is actually pretty deadly. 500 to 1.2 million deaths worldwide from complications from it. And this is one that uh, acute and chronic infections with hepatitis B can lead to uh, cirrhosis and then hepatocellular carcinoma, which is inevitably what would kill you. Um, it, it is endemic in a lot of South. Southeast Asian countries. And then now there are some treatment options. So like multi-drug regimens. And as with hepatitis C, I think there are going to be some treatments at like cures really it's here soon. So hepatitis C is the most common chronic bloodborne infection in the United States. Uh, we see it very frequently. A lot of patients will have it. Um, it's transmitted through contact with exposure to blood transfusions, kind of like with hepatitis B sharing needles, sex cross, it does cross the placenta and uh, you can get it through breastfeeding. It will more often lead to chronic hepatitis. You don't often get an acute hepatitis with hepatitis C. So a lot of people have this for many years before they actually know that they have the disease. It, like I said, it's usually, it can be asymptomatic for decades. Um, you will get elevated direct and indirect bilirubin. So you, that can be a subtle finding of hepatitis C in patients if they have elevated bilirubin and it's both their direct and indirect. Uh, patients with hepatitis C are susceptible to severe hepatitis if they get hepatitis A or B. Um, and then patients kind of along those lines, patients with chronic hepatitis C, if they're alcoholics, they're more susceptible to um, the effects of that and cirrhosis in hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, it, so now there are cures for it and it's a, a combination of interferon antiviral drug and patients are having a lot of success with this here. Hepatitis D it can only propagate in the presence of hepatitis B virus. Uh, so they basically, it has to have hepatitis B. There's no independent life cycle. It cannot be without hepatitis B. So it causes a lot of the same symptoms and what we discussed. Hepatitis E is much more like hepatitis A. It's fecal oral transmission. Uh, it can cause an acute hepatitis, but it can also cause a more fulminant course in like pregnant women. So people will die from the, even the acute hepatitis if it's hepatitis E. So in pregnant women, you can have up to a 20% mortality rate in these patients. And it's much more prevalent in the, it's very prevalent in India. So next and one you know, this is one that's good. To, I get. I think this is a good one to refresh because we don't always diagnose it uh, in the emergency department, but it can. It's likely causing a, a lot of issues that we see. So cytomegalovirus is is very common worldwide. Um, prevalence is estimated to range between fifty and ninety percent of the world, and then almost a hundred percent of patients in Africa and Asia likely have cytomegalovirus like had a transmission of it and then it's dormant in their bodies. It is contracted through sexual contact, blood or bodily fluid exposure or close contact, which is why so many people have it. Uh, it establishes a primary infection. So you get a viral illness followed by a long period where nothing and that can be decades. And then you can get a reactivation during stress or immunosuppressant. Uh, the initial onset, like primary infection can be either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. And that's like flu-like illness or kind of with any other viral illness. Primary infection is, can be a mononucleosis in immunocompetent patients. So prolonged malaise, myalgias, and fever. 
Uh, immunocompetent patients can also develop complicated infections, obviously. So they can get infections anywhere with cytomegalovirus. And we talked about this with some of the during our opportunistic infections lecture. Uh, neonatal congenital infections of cytomegalovirus can be very severe and are characterized more by petechia, jaundice, hepatosplenomegaly, growth retardation, hearing loss, and uh, hypotonia. So cytomegalovirus can cause tons of other complicated things like we talked about, but to touch on them briefly again, so in AIDS patients, you can get a colitis, esophagitis, enteritis, retinitis, um, and that is usually if your CD4 count is under 50. The retinitis is the most serious ocular complication in HIV patients, and vision loss uh, is, this is how some AIDS patients will end up with vision loss, and that occurs due to the retinitis or retinal detachment. So if you're suspicious of it, that's you have to consult ophthalmology. Um, you can also get cytomegalovirus if you have ulcerative colitis, and that would be an infection of the colon in somebody that's already susceptible. So pretty hard to diagnose, and the way to truly diagnose is it through a biopsy, but because the barrier is, is weak, because of the... <clears throat> ulcerative colitis, it makes you more susceptible, sorry, <laughs> to the disease. So you kind of get a super infection, super inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract, and that would be diagnosed with a tissue biopsy. And these patients would need IV uh, antiviral medications. Um, cytomegalovirus in organ transplant patients, they can contract um, it and then it can spread anywhere. It can also be transmitted during the transplantation. So if the patient that gets the organ did not previously have it, the organ they get has been infected with cytomegalovirus, then they can then contract the cytomegalovirus and it could spread to different parts of the body. And this is uh, especially true because then you're on immunosuppressant medications, your immune system is weak, making you more susceptible. Um, in lung transplant patients, they can contract a pneumonia, and that is a significant cause of morbidity and mortality and, and one of the more common causes in, uh, in organ transplant patients. Um, another one that is starting to become like people are seeing more and more or like identifying is CMV viremia in, and pneumonia in people that are on a mechanical ventilator for a prolonged period of time. So, you know, and, and especially these patients, they're often getting sputum cultures and cultures back and it's coming back as CMV. And that could be a new infection or it could be just with their immune system weakened by being on the ventilator, then the latent uh, CMV that they have, have in their body is reactivating and then causing an infection. Uh, for diagnosis, you can use imaging, which can show characteristic findings in MRI of the brain for encephalitis, um, or you can do PCR testing of serum, blood, or lung tissue, or sputum, and that can help identify the disease. And gastrointestinal disease, as said, you can get tissue biopsy. You can't really do stool, stool cultures. They're not very accurate. Um, patients that have a severe disease will get treated with antiviral medications, and they usually require treatment until uh, PCR testing is negative. And something to consider with CMV, and we'll talk about with Epstein-Barr viruses, you know, like there's a lot of theories that like HPV or human papillomavirus causing uterine cancers, there's, there's likely, CMV is likely a putting you at risk or having these infections for many type of malignancies. And I think in time, we'll, we'll, they're going to identify more and more cancers that are propagated by having these chronic viruses uh, in patients. So just another thing to keep in mind. Um, Epstein-Barr virus or EBV. So uh, Epstein-Barr virus is also very common and 
almost like over 90% could likely have Epstein-Barr virus and have had contracted it sometime in their life and have it latent in their body. Uh, it initially infects the epithelium and lymphoid tissue in the oral pharynx and then can spread hematogenously to infect B lymphocytes throughout the body. Um, and like I was saying with cytomegalovirus. So history of Epstein-Barr virus uh, is linked to the development, and this one has been shown, but has been linked to the development of nasopharyngeal carcinomas, Burkitt's lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and gastric cancer, and, and there may be more. Um, the T lymphocyte response is primarily responsible for the control of the infection. So particular patients with HIV, which have a deficiency in T cells, uh, are associated and at risk for prolonged shedding or issues with the Epstein-Barr virus and then the associated malignancies. So infectious mononucleosis or the initial disease that you would contract with Epstein-Barr is characterized by sore throat, uh, cervical lymphadenopathy, and that's posterior and anterior fatigue, upper respiratory system, symptoms, headache, decreased appetite, and then myalgias. And the fatigue is like the big one that should set you off to this, and it can be prolonged over weeks. Uh, one risk that you can also get is the splenomegaly, enlargement of the spleen, as well as the liver. Uh, it's common in the primary infection, and that's really, as your job, the big thing to tell patients and look out for. You can also get hematological complications. Uh, they're not usually, they don't usually cause a lot of morbidity, but they can cause issues. So you'd get, you could get a hemolytic anemia, a thrombocytopenia, aplastic anemia, or a DIC in severe cases. In very rare cases, you can also contract CNS involvement or a pericarditis. So if for diagnosis, there is a, a swab for this. You can see some things on a CBC. So you can get a over 50% lymphocytosis. You, a lot of patients will have a transaminitis. So a period of time with the elevated LFTs, um, not usually your bilirubin though. So the monospot or the immediate test for it is not that sensitive. So if they, the CDC here actually recommends against using it routinely. So somebody's had multiple diseases or multiple tests or they're a little more ill, then you can do it. But a lot of times it's just diagnosed based on um, clinical suspicion. If you are worried, you can also get the IgG and IgM viral capsid antigen tests, but they're not as readily available. Uh, you, If you kind of to rule it out and make you think, you could get a a strep test, if it's negative and they have symptoms, the symptoms above, then it might clue you in more to a mono. If you see somebody that has severe symptoms, you don't always look for states of immune, immunosuppression. The treatment is really symptomatic. Big thing, like I said, is the splenic rupture. You got to warn patients. So you have to pre prevent any injury to the spleen as it's enlarged. So minimizing strenuous activity and then being very cautious, like especially in teenagers, this is more common or athletes and uh, preventing any contact sport until symptoms resolve. And some people will say as long as six weeks. Uh, you can use steroids if just to help with the throat pain, but you they don't help with much except for symptoms unless, uh, and so it's, it's kind of up to you and up to the provider. I probably, you know, a lot of these patients, you may end up giving one dose of like a Decadron to help and then just otherwise controlling symptoms. Um, so yeah, that is kind of it. There's a lot of information there. Like I said, there's so many other viruses. We didn't touch on HIV or COVID or a lot of other respiratory illnesses, but these are a few that I think always we can refresh on and to see and to be aware of and familiar with. So yeah, any questions before we start the questions? <laughs> All right. Well, first question. A 26 year old previously healthy male presents to the ED in January with a chief complaint of two day history of fever, 
cough, diffuse body aches, and general malaise. He reports no history of influenza vaccination. His vital signs, he has a pulse of 110, blood pressure of 130 over 75, respiratory rate of 18, uh, pulse ox of 97% on room air. Which of the following is true? Um, Oseltamivir reduces the risk of serious complication of influenza. Immunizing the patient with the influenza vaccine in the ED will have hasten recovery or s prevent recovery. Uh, Oseltamivir may cause nausea and vomiting. Oseltamivir reduces the spread of influenza to unaffected patients or E, all of the above. Anybody else want to answer? <coughs> Great. Yeah, so this one, answer is C. So also, some of your may cause nausea and vomiting. So, so you know, we talked about as being like the most likely side effect of it. So this patient has likely has flu with the symptoms. Um, it did start 48 hours within the illness, within the presentation. So you could prescribe it. You know, would I in this patient? Probably not. They say he's healthy, 26, but you could. Um, and in this patient, so we can look, it does, it does not reduce the risk of serious complications. We talked about that. Uh, it would really only reduce the duration of symptoms. Uh, immunizing this patient does not slow the recovery. If you want, you can immunize a patient when they have active disease with influenza. Uh, in my experience, most patients don't want that, but you can. And then it does not, uh, and then the, it will not... Um, decrease spread. So giving this disease does not cure it. It does not decrease the viral load. So you can still spread the disease just as easily if you're taking uh, Tamiflu or also Tamivir. So nausea and vomiting. Next one. So a 65-year-old female presents with right eye pain, irritation, foreign body sensation, and tearing Skin lesions are seen on the right side of the forehead. They do not cross the midline and the conjunctiva are injected. A uh, slit lamp examination reveals pseudodendrites. So those are shown in that picture. Which of the following is true? Patient with associated nasal vesicles should not receive topical ophthalmic steroids. Cranial nerve seven is most commonly involved anterior uveal involvement is dependent upon severity of corneal disease, or D, systemic antivirals are more effective than topical antivirals. And this is a tough one because we didn't explicitly talk about it in the lecture, but I wanted to really highlight this. So that's why I just saved it for the question for us to talk about. So just give it a shot and then we'll talk about the answer here.
and I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this one so we can talk about it because like I said this is a tough question and we didn't explicitly talk about it but we will here so this patient has a herpes zoster um, ophthalmicus uh, so you can see that indicated to us it's herpes zoster because it does not cross the midline and then the pseudodendrites are characteristic of this um, most patients will have the prodromic like headache fever, generalized malaise, and then the development of the rash. So Hutchinson sign is when you have a vesicular eruption over the nose, secondary to the virus. And that is from the involvement of the nasociliary branch of the trigeminal nerve. Um, since the same branch, and that's uh, cranial nerve five, since and so since the same branch innervates the globe, uh, these patients are at increased risk for ocular involvement. So it's actually cranial nerve five, which is why B would not be. Um, cranial nerve seven is the facial nerve, which uh, is going to do predominantly motor function. Cranial nerve five is going to be more the sensory. And so this is like a sensory issue. And so more often cranial nerve five. In these patients, so if you see any involvement on the face or this Hutchinson sign, so on the nose, then you want to be aware and be really, really like, you got to stay in the eye and look for these pseudodendrites. If you have this finding, so the pseudodendrites in a zoster, and then that indicates the ophthalmicus, that is an ophthalmological emergency or urgency, and you should contact consult opto to make sure it's not involving anything deeper, deeper structures. And then they should be followed because this can ultimately affect the vision. Um, in these patients, you do want to put them on systemic antivirals. So you can use topical antivirals, but because there's involvement of the whole nerve branch, you can continue to get it if you're just putting topical antiviral cream on the eye. So you wanna make sure that they're on systemic antivirals. So any facial involvement of a suspected zoster, make sure you're staining the eye um, and then and having an awareness. And if they come early with a lot of facial pain, you know, this should be on your differential, still stay in the eye if somebody has pain on the side of their face, look for this as an early sign, and then make sure that they're, if the rash has not erupted, but you're thinking, hey, this could be a possibility that they get close follow-up or they can even return to the ER for you to, um, to evaluate. So yeah, tough question, but important thing to remember with herpes zoster. Next one, which of the following occurs earliest during hepatitis A infection? Um, A, nausea and vomiting. B, fecal excretion. C, viremia, uh, or like transmission of the virus, shedding of the virus, as that's what the viremia means. D, transaminitis, or E, jaundice. So this one, also a tough question, but uh, and something didn't explicitly say, but so hepatitis A, and you, if you look back, you can see it, it actually takes a while. So hepatitis A is extremely common. Um, a lot of the cases are actually asymptomatic. And so you can get the viremia immediately, and that's the first symptom. Or And by viremia, that's a tough word in English and let alone if it's your second language, but by viremia, they mean the spreading of the virus or transmission of the virus, viral shedding. So you can continue to shed the virus and give it to other people the first two to four weeks after exposure. Um, 
after those first couple weeks, then you'll get fecal excretion and then the transaminitis. And with that, those nonspecific symptoms of nausea and vomiting. So oftentimes the nausea and vomiting doesn't occur until five to 10 weeks after you've already contracted the disease and you didn't know you had it and you shed it or, or spread it to other people. Uh, and so something to remember. So it actually is a very prolonged uh, time before onset and actually not that long compared to some of the other hepatitises, but a slightly longer as far as a virus. So nausea, vomiting later on, so five to 10 weeks. So something to remember too when you're questioning patients uh, or something to keep in mind that it's not always exposure within several days, but actually five to 10 weeks prior to when you're seeing them. And next one, which of the following is true regarding viral hepatitis? A, adult patients infected with acute hepatitis B are more likely to become chronic carriers than patients with acute hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is most common acquired through sexual intercourse with an infected individual. Hepatitis C is the most common viral cause of fulminant hepatic failure. B, both direct and indirect bilirubin are typically elevated in roughly equal amounts. Or E, leukocytosis is a harbinger of fulminant hepatic failure. And that just means leukocytosis uh, would be an, like an elevated white blood cell count would be an indicator of, of full uh, liver failure. And I did not write these questions and it's really hard to write questions. So some of them are okay, but I looked at the best ones I could find. And a lot of times I put these questions in just to get us talking about a little bit more in depth about some of these topics or a slightly different part of what we've already talked about. So I'll do this one. So this one is actually D, the direct and indirect bilirubin are elevated. And this kind of just a process of elimination question. Um, you know, it's it's tough. And so kind of to go through it. So adult patients that acquire hepatitis B are less likely to develop chronic hepatitis. Um, so it doesn't usually cause it's less likely as opposed to hepatitis C, which is much more common to cause chronic hepatitis. Um, hepatitis C is more commonly contracted through IV drug use than sexual intercourse. Uh, so remember that it's actually very common in your IV drug users. Hepatitis C is the least common uh, to cause fulminant hepatic failure. So you don't often get that acute liver failure, severe liver, liver failure from it. It's more of a prolonged course uh, that can long-term lead to cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. Co-infection with hepatitis B and D is, is common. Um, so in this case, it's just to remember like with hepatitis C or viral hepatitis, you're going to get an elevation of both direct and indirect bilirubin, and it's going to be a elevated pretty equally. Whereas other causes, like as opposed to viral hepatitis, other causes of hepatitis, you'll more often see just that elevated direct bilirubin um, in certain cases or versus an elevated indirect bilirubin. So the bilirubin can help differentiate the cause of liver disease if you see it elevated. So something to keep in mind. And last question, a 44-year-old male presents to the ED 
with a three-day history of painful rash on the right buttock and leg. He has a history of inflammatory bowel disease and is on immunosuppressive therapy. His, he first presented to his primary care provider who referred him to the emergency department due to concern for disseminated uh, varicella zoster infection. Which of the following is true? A, lung involvement or pneumonitis is the most common presentation of disseminated or or zoster virus. The patient will likely, most likely be resistant to standard treatment of acyclovir. Given the time onset, the patient should receive corticosteroids without antiviral treatment. D, mortality is most often caused by sepsis from bacterial superinfection of skin lesions. Or E, even in immunocompromised patients, disseminated uh, varicell zoster virus is rare. I'm going to give you the answer because I know you guys have to go see Shuni is giving his uh, thing. So E, so we talked about this disseminated varicella zoster is going to be, uh, it's in, it's most often going to be very rare and patients tolerated are right. Um, this patient or others, you're going to suspect that it's disseminated if more than three dermatomes are involved or the rash uh, starts to go outside of your single dermatome. Visceral involvement can include pneumonitis, and more, more often than not, pneumonitis would be what causes the mortality from this. There is no proven benefit for use in steroids, and you should use acyclovir uh, in these patients. So all of them should get acyclovir. So yeah, that is this question. I know you guys are going, I will, I heard. Shuni, are you going to start doing, are you doing ultrasound now? No, I think we're going to, they're going to do like a talk on dengue fever, I think. And then I'm going to do like cases. Like no, gonna, are you, oh, I thought you were doing ultrasound right, teaching right now or no? Uh, no, I've just been kind of doing oh, a okay. shift. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, Is what Matt wanted me to do. So I don't know. Yeah, no, that's great. I, yeah, I didn't know. If, um, but, but well, it's fine. Yeah. So, well, next week we're going to have a special thon going to come and give us a talk on dengue fever, which would be great. So I'll create a Zoom link. So look for a Zoom link for me and uh, it should be really great. And we're going to maybe include some of the our colleagues from over here to see if we can get more people to join in and hear about something. So, yeah. Are you enjoying your time over there? Yeah, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yeah. I good. think I finally got okay. used to the heat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. How much longer are you there for? Uh, until the 31st. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. That's a pretty good sized trip, huh? Have you I been know. able to travel and stuff? Uh, no, but I'm going to, I'm going to Hawaii tomorrow. Oh, okay. Cool. Well, have fun. Are you working? Do they have you working every day? Uh, almost every day. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's probably a good experience. You'll have to tell me about it when you get back. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting. I bet. <laughs> well, you'll have to tell me. Okay. Well, I'll let you go. Cool. Take Thanks. care. Be safe. Bye. <laughs> Bye.